Hi everybody, good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, afternoon's Catapult Lockdown Virtual Saloon where I be, will be in discussion with uh, Brandon Best from uh, Barbados. My name is Lucette Verbeau. I come from Curacao and I'm very happy to be here with you today. But before I begin, I would like to place a huge, huge thanks to the Catapult partners who make this event possible and the partners that includes American Friends of Jamaica, Kinston Creative and Fresh Milk that make, they are making this uh, series of saloon possible. Especially coming from Curacao, where I've been working for over 25 years as a gallerist, it's uh, very hard to come in contact with the uh, Caribbean, other Caribbean islands, especially because we are down here um, more to the south and you are all up there and uh, we speak different languages. But it's so fine, so happy to see that we can connect through this catapult um, virtual saloon. Um, please feel free to ask your questions in the comments during this uh, talk and we will get back to you at the Q&A segment of the Saloon. Uh, but I said, I am talking today with uh, Brandon Best and he comes from uh, Barbados. Actually, he's a very young artist. I'm happy to talk to a young artist because um, most of the time when you are um, in this business, you have your own group with which you work with and we work with a lot of curious artists but also artists for other Dutch Caribbean islands and now um, being able to talk to a different group of artists is very uh, rewarding for me uh, but also this young artist because um, Brandon is only 25 uh, 22 years old and I was looking for him like on on on, on the website or so but then I realized that these young people, I mean, they have an Instagram. They communicate their work through the Instagram. And Brandon, that's what Brandon does. I mean, actually, he is very, very active on Instagram. And I'm so impressed of his work. He works a lot. He has a lot of work. So um, that's what we are going to talk uh, about this afternoon with him. So Brandon, how are you? Welcome. Happy to have you. Hi. Uh, afternoon. There you go. <laughs> How are you? How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Okay, good. It's been a pretty good day in terms of weather. Like for in, in lately in Barbados, it's been raining a lot, and today has been the first day that it's been consistently not raining. <laughs> so I'm happy about that. Oh my gosh! And we are yeah. praying here in Curacao for some rain. It's so yeah. hot. I mean, really. I mean, we are like, when is going to rain? So. You Jeez. are having all the rain we want, it seems like. Uh, yeah. yeah, tell me, you're a very, very young artist, and um, I just want to talk to you and hear about what you're doing, how you start with art, and did you go to art school? Are you studying art? Um, how come you have so many works uh, on Instagram? Just tell me something about you. Okay, so... I guess we can start at the beginning. I would say I started drawing when I was about nine years old. No, about seven or eight. That was when I actually gave it a go. And I was just like pencil and paper. Um, and at that point, obviously being a child, I was watching a lot of cartoons. So at the time, I any of the content that I was creating as a, as a child was just a pencil. It was everything based off of cartoon characters or movie characters. And growing up, I never thought that I would be, be taking art seriously. It was just something that was of a, of a hobby that I enjoyed for myself and among my friends. And it wasn't until I think I was uh, 13, 14. It was when I had then been enrolled to the Carterton International School of Barbados, where the arts were very much appreciated. And I was also around people that were not only Bajans, it was international school, so I was around Germans, English, French, Spanish, and that just opened my eyes and my my horizons as to I don't know what 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 were the tastes beyond the island, and also my art teacher uh, was German, and she very much believed in my abilities, even when I didn't have much faith in myself, 
and I was around like a lot of like quote unquote prodigies, and they were prod prodigy painters, and I was so intimidated by their skills that I did not want to go anywhere near painting. I just wanted to keep to my pencil drawing, and I, I thought that would be good enough. Um, May I interrupt you? How come you were to international school? You are from Barbados. Uh, your parents are from abroad that you went to the international school. How come you were in the international school? Um, it was just, it It was more so that my parents were seizing the opportunity. Well, first of all, my, my mom is Guyanese and my father is Bajan. But my mom's been here for since she was about five, six years old. Um, and it just, I think, if I remember correctly, I believe they heard of Codrington from a family friend and they checked it out. They thought it'd be a great opportunity for me. So I left where I was, which is at a public school called Dyson Griffith. And I transferred there to Codrington when I was about 12 going on 13. And that's how that came about. Um, and long story short, fast forward about six years, I was about 18. And I was at this weird place in my life where I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do, but I figured that if it wasn't going to be art, I was going to be interested in social sciences. So initially I was going to go to Canada to study political science. But despite that, my art teacher was like, Brandon, believe it or not, you're going to become an artist. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's not happening. But lo and behold, uh, I ended up not going to that university in Canada. I stayed here in Barbados to do a gap year. And then that was when, um, during that gap year was when I discovered how much I like to cook. And that was when I then enrolled at the local uh, college to study culinary arts. And while studying and after studying culinary arts, I got very much involved in the hospitality industry here. So professionally, I was a bartender and a waiter. And this is like after 2016, I graduated in 2016. 2017 was when I was in the middle of you know, the cooking and the gap year, blah, 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 blah. And that was when I picked up oil pastels because I got bored of the realistic black and white drawings and I wanted some color, but I didn't want to paint. So I found the oil pastels and I was doing that for a few months and I stopped drawing again. And then fast forward two years when I um, was having a similar feeling as, to, as I was in the beginning of summer of 2016, where I felt like lost or I wanted to do something that felt fulfilling or made sense. That was when I went back to art again. But instead of oil pastels, I wanted to, 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 I don't know, not, I don't want to say take a risk, but you know, go out of my comfort zone and do the one thing that I was intimidated by most, which was painting. And it was doing my own research of artists such as Egon Schiele, George Kondo and Jean-Michel Basquiat that I looked at their work and I realized that they didn't do their work minding what other people were doing per se. They just felt comfortable doing what it was that they did. So I realized that I needed to find my own voice, my own style. And um, I always tell people that art is very much a, a visual language. And like most languages, there's a dialect and an accent. So I just needed to find my dialect or my accent within painting. So, so actually, it's um, it's you yourself that um, I mean, you are struggling by yourself with what you wanted, where you wanted to go, what you wanted with your art, or what you wanted with your life. I mean, at that moment, it's not uh, like you were having people guiding you to do something or to do something with your art or with your culinary art or with your bartendership or whatever. Yeah, uh, I was more so. When it came to art, no, I didn't have any guidance per se, apart from Carla Hines, I, my art teacher back when I was in secondary school. Uh, but when it came to other things like, oh, Brian, you should be a lawyer or study economics. Like, I always had guidance towards that because obviously, um, especially in the Caribbean more so than in North America or Europe, art is not looked at as a safe, secure uh, line of work. But I think, well, I think that if you approach it aggressively wholeheartedly and maintain your integrity like you can make it work it just depends how, like, you're not going to know overnight i didn't know overnight <laughs> so you just keep producing and doing the work and then eventually you will 
develop some form of business model, whether you want, you're the kind of person to get into graphic design and you want to do t-shirts or if you want to do jeans or if you want to do posters or you just want to do paintings. Um, yes, yeah, just and a, then, a really a inner something from your inside that just pushes you in that direction to do yeah. art. Actually. In my case, like I felt like no matter what other things I was trying, it's not that it wasn't working, but it would either be done at a mediocre level or just, or it, I felt like I couldn't push it further to the point where I could actually see myself doing it for the rest of my life. And in that case, um, when I started painting, that's when my quote unquote life started to make sense. Or I felt like I wasn't lost anymore. Like things were going much easier that way. Cause I was doing something that made sense to me, something that I could develop, something that I could do on my own. Um, and yeah, <laughs> that's as much as I can say about that. Yeah, because you're mentioning like um, you, it was something that when uh, from your inside that are pushing you. But I mean, you have parents, you have siblings. Uh, mm -hmm. How were your parents? Uh, what were their point of view uh, with your paintings, with your way of uh, wanting to define your own life? Mm. Well, my siblings thought it was cool, <laughs> and then okay. my mom, my mom was, my mom was pretty supportive. You know, um, she particularly liked the work that. Well, my earliest work was was fairly dark and rigid and chaotic, but the the work that I did that was more appealing to her eyes, whether it was something that was. Um, I don't know, prettier, prettier colors. And generally speaking, she was a, so she was supportive of my work and she always encouraged me to just do what felt right, do what felt real to me. As for my dad, he did a, he did like some of my work, but for the most part, uh, I suppose how can I say this? I I think I'll just leave it at saying that. I guess my dad just wanted to see, because my dad has seen me like pick up things and drop them. You think what I'm saying? Like, so he wanted to see yeah. how far I would develop. He wanted to see if this was something that was going to be. Yeah. yeah, he wanted to see consistency. So he wanted to see if this was something temporary or this was something that I was actually taking seriously and carrying to a mature level. So, so I would say, I would say in ten months, yes, he definitely likes the painting now. Because okay. he's, he's, seen, he's seen how much has come of it and how seriously okay. I take it. So. so in Barbados, you have an um, art academy. So did you decide to apply to go to the academy? No. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? Because I'm, too, I'm so comfortable doing what I do. I'm not sure how I feel about going to classes and then having somebody I don't, I, well, I guess it long, I guess you could say I don't like being told what to do, <laughs> but, but I don't know. I, I, I've just been so comfortable doing it outside of school. I don't want to mix the two because if I'm going to go back to school, it's going to be for something outside of art, something maybe, um, something like, I, like, as I may have uh, discussed with you previously, I study political science now. So I'm, trying not to limit myself to just one line of work or one industry. I want to be into many different things at once. Okay. Or not many, many different things, but I want to be... So politics and arts, those are two things that you would not regularly see somebody interested in at the same time. But I want to develop my life in such a way that they can be molded with together. So I don't know if I will be... For example, here we have the National Cultural Foundation that has everything to do with the national artworks and creative works of the island. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure, maybe one day I'll get involved in that. Maybe I'll get involved in the Ministry of uh, Culture and Creative Practices and such and such. Or I may yeah. end up being diplomat or a cultural ambassador. But I want, bottom line, from since I started painting, especially being more comfortable in the way that I paint, I want people to realize on this island, you could paint whatever you want. Like the sky is the limit because there tends to be a trend here or um, 
is is quite small as to what we consider art or what we consider good art here in Barbados. So there tends to be a trend in terms of subject matter, which tends to be, you know, very impressionistic things such as like the landscapes of the East Coast or the beaches of the South or the catamarambles, the turtles. And all of that is fantastic. But I feel that you that we could present ourselves to the world on a more deep level because art because all art is a reflection of you and the people to which it is referencing so yeah. i so my work for example i just like th i think i could say about 95 98 percent of what i do is something that's personal to me or it's an observation of my professional life or an opinion that i may have that i illustrated that is based on my life experience growing up in barbados i think that's something that is worth uh, telling the world it's a story to be told and you know I think that there's a lot of work for us Asian artists to do yeah okay I mean you're young you're full, full of um, expectations and actually yeah, you work white in my is... eye. very innocent <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're right I mean but I mean your work talks for itself and um, before the lockdown you were working as a bartender isn't it yeah. <laughs> so uh, during the lockdown, all the bars were closed and everything. Mm -hmm. So what did you do? Uh, so lockdown in Barbados basically started in the beginning of March, I want to say, like the first week of March, yeah. more or less. And I spent nearly every single day of lockdown painting. Or if I wasn't painting, I was drawing. And that's all I ever wanted to do. I mean, yes, I, I mean, Netflix got boring. And um, sometimes I'll play video games, but 80% of my day would be, I would be in my bedroom. I would be sitting on my bed to the side, facing the desk that I had. I was up against the wall and I'll have the canvas uh, braced against the wall because I didn't have an easel at the time. And I'll just be painting, 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 painting. On your painting, bed, painting. on your bed. Yeah. Yeah, I used to paint on my bed. I had a lot of stains. Uh, mother wasn't very happy about that. But, um, no, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but I got in, I got in that routine and a habit, and it, and um, you know when you do something when you do something that you love, it doesn't feel like work. So it just comes naturally to you. In my case, on a daily basis, and so I was spending about eight to thirteen hours daily just painting. And obviously, it locked down. I have nowhere to go, no job to go to, no class to go to. So I would start painting. I work best at evening time, night. So I would start painting from about five, about five, six o'clock, or latest eight o'clock. And then I will probably finish painting by about three. And I would have a painting ready to present on my Instagram page by the afternoon after. So I got in this habit from Monday to, to Friday, I would have four or five paintings to present on my Instagram page. So I got in the habit of daily posts or I would just take the weekends off. It would be Monday to Friday or Tuesday to Saturday. Um, I would do that for about three weeks. And then the fourth week in that month, I would take a little break, uh, give my wallet a break as well. <laughs> Come the following week, then I would buy canvases again. I, I got in the habit of getting a lot of um, 18 by 24 inch and 16 by 20 inch. And that was my size of preference. Um, so for about three months, and for three weeks in each month, I was doing a... I was doing a painting a day. So mm -hmm. that, that, that work ethic has been carried to me even up to the, today. I mean, my work, how can I put this? My work ethic isn't quite the same because I realized that I just, I put more attention on, I put more attention and I'm very careful as to what's going on up here before I produce my work. So for example, the last two pieces that I did, I had those canvases from since almost two weeks ago. And uh, I've been working on them over the course of a week and a half. And I only just posted them in the past two days. So nowadays, it's not that I slow down because I'm running out of ideas. It's because I want to be sure of what I'm doing. What, what is it representing? What does it mean? Where is it coming from? Um, even colors. like Because in my earliest where I got in the habit of lots of red, lots of yellow, lots of blue. So nowadays, I'm... I've got in the habit of, I've developed, I could, if I may say so myself, where I try to blend colors more often, widen my color scheme. So I use a lot of Naples yellow, 
uh, flesh tints. Now I've been using like greens. Green is something. Green is my favorite color, but ironically, I don't like painting with it. But lately, I've been trying to make it work. Like, what other color can I blend it with to make it easier on my eyes and still do what it is I want to do? Uh, okay. And yeah, so Brandon was just just painting during lockdown. That's it. And then okay. it was about July that I then got into another bartending job. But what happened with that now is two months into it, it was getting quite chaotic, especially with the circumstances of uh, COVID that we're trying to run this bar. And just around the corner, two months into this job, I was having my first, I was exhibiting for the very first time. It was a group exhibition with uh, Artist Alliance Barbados at Lime Grove. And that was, so there was that, which went well. But then I think less than two weeks later, what happened was, is that I had, what was it? It was the, another exhibition at Lime Grove. No, was it? What happened on the Sunday? Anyway, the point is, is that I had, the point is, is that I had an event featuring my work on Sunday, and then I had another event on Wednesday, and then I had an event on Saturday. So I realized that to prepare artwork for these events, oh, I remember Sunday was my second solo show ever. And then Wednesday was Barbados Connect, which was a mixer. And they were featuring me as, as the artist, the visual arts talent. So I had my okay. artwork against the wall in the cigar bar. And then Saturday was PM Splash, which was some. Um, okay, I mean, we are talking a lot about your work, but um, I, I have, of course, I've been looking for your work and everything. And I see so mm. much um, uh, different kind of words, actually. So mm -hmm. I would want to see, like, um, I want to talk about, because you say also that the work that you, it's what's going on in your mind, what's going on in your life. That's what mm -hmm. you are painting. So I would want to put up the work, um, Swim, We Don't Sink, because mm -hmm. it's a little bit different than the other works. And yeah. um, I want to see what was going on when you were painting this work, because it's different than the other works that you're doing. Okay, so to put it shortly, what happened was is that uh, a friend of mine had a spare canvas. It was quite big. It was 34 by 47 inches. And he said, do something with it. Do whatever you want. And I was like, okay. And at that point in time, I wasn't speaking to my brother. Uh, him and I had were, were frequently butting heads growing up, especially since we we're so close in age. We're only 16 months apart. And I did this painting that is based on a relationship and the title also correlates with the whole concept. Swim, we don't sink. Uh, so him and I not get along with one another, but whether we like it or not, like most, not all, but most relationships with your siblings, um, you're, you're much stronger and you could accomplish a lot more if you work together. So it's either we swim together or we can sink and drown together. So that, was, that basically sums up the relationship with my brother and I. Him being the so he he was the light he not was he is the life of the party, he is a wild card. Um, some even consider him to be to be even a little nuts, and I personified all of that into the bizarre and bright not bright but yellow, whitish colored uh, deep sea creature near the bottom of the canvas, that weird fish, and then me being the big old whale near the middle of the painting. So. We're two very different beings, but we're in the same biome, the same ecosystem. And in order for this ecosystem to, to work, we have to get along with one another uh, despite our differences. And that's basically what that piece is about. And it was the first time that I was using so much turquoise and grays and black and blending them in such a way that I could create this scenario that I painted here. With, as opposed to using blue. Does this painting, actually, when you were painting, that you realized what the relationship was with your brother? Or you painted it because of the relationship with your brother? I painted it because of the relationship with my brother. <laughs> OK. So, so that's so totally different. Because if we can pull out like the work um, Mr. Blackie, 
Mm -hmm. I just wanted just to show the difference between the way you work. I mean, mm -hmm. this is such a different work than swim, don't sink. Yeah, because swim, you don't sink was, it was painted in September. Mr. Blackie was painted in January. And in January was when I was working at this high-end restaurant and I liked the restaurant, but the work environment itself was extremely stressful, as you can imagine, because there's all the expectations they have to live, so they have to work up to, and um, yeah. So, and then apart from that, I wasn't very happy with myself either, because despite having some level of security working at this nice job, I wasn't sure what direction my life was going. Was I going to travel again by the summer? Was I going to go back to school? Um, I don't. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I got in the habit of doing a lot of drinking and a lot of smoking of cigarettes, though. And you you also, yourself, though. Yeah. My yeah. me myself, yeah. And this painting is basically a personification of everything that it that I don't like about myself and everything that I don't like about the negative aspects of Barbados. So that being alcoholism, arrogance, um, complacency, and I put it all into this one character who, yes, he may be wearing a red tie and be looking as if though he's ready to go to work, but he's actually sitting on the pavement, having a drink as if though he's sitting outside of a rum shop. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, he's he has a halo up against, uh, not against, up above the glass. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what people don't realize is that what you, what you like what you worship or what what you're heavily in the habit of that's basically your god so you can fall almost a slave to your own habits whether it's alcohol cigarettes um partying and that could slowly but surely destroy you or make you become somebody that you don't want to be whether whether you want to call that a monster or a fiend whatever okay how is uh, i mean do you have i i'm listening to you and i'm thinking um, what is your relationship? Okay, with you brought up it with your friends, uh, with your surroundings. Do you drink with them? Do you party with your friends? Or uh, nowadays, I don't do much socializing at all. I mean, recently was my brother's birthday. That was the that was a great time. I had a few drinks, but uh, with my friends generally, uh, we're all living our own lives. Uh, so nowadays, I mostly just studying painting whenever i can um trying to make time for friends when i can but we're all young adults and we're each of us are on our own path trying to find, find uh, establish who we are or what we're going to do with the rest of our lives and for me i didn't grow up with a lot of artistic friends per se so i find lately i've been trying to speak with uh speak with network with other creatives and it's been pretty all right so far, but I, I honestly do not make that much time to socialize because I spent from 2016 to 2019, that's three years of partying and late nights. So I feel almost like burnt out at 22 <laughs> from that wow. socialite life. But yeah, it sounds ridiculous. Uh, people would say, oh no, you have enough life to live right now. Like, I think that for those three years, I did an ample amount of partying and I feel like I could very much dial it back and be about, be a bit more serious with myself. Not too serious. I can have a good laugh any day of the week. But I, I honestly just prefer to to paint and read, do some casual studying. Okay. And maybe like one day in the week, I might see a friend or they'll come over by me. But me and a bar, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, no, I can understand. I mean, you have had a lot of that, I mean, especially working in a bar. I mean, yeah, most of, of the it. time is when the bar closed, that's where friends meet, the friends working in the bar, that's when they mm -hmm. meet. And yeah. then they go partying. Yep. So I can understand that for you, this is like a chapter that you want to close and move on with your life. Yeah. Uh, how do you combine like the painting with your study? Because um, uh, studying political, political science mm -hmm. and then doing art with um, on your own is this kind of um how do you do you relate your uh your study with your work that you are not more, more like now 
also looking at your surroundings, not only your inside, but also your surroundings. And um, uh, combining your study with your um, um, artistic expression. I would say at this point in time, it's a little too early for me to be considering to mesh uh, my studies with my art. I haven't, I haven't, no ideas have clicked in that aspect of my life as yet. So I feel like the work that I've been doing for the past few days and maybe in the next few weeks are still going to be reflections of what's going on in here and my observations of whatever. But I feel like what I'm studying, I'm still early in my program. It's only been a few weeks, but um, I feel like soon enough it will happen. Like, cause my work tends to be very spontaneous and within the moment, mm -hmm. I don't plan paintings. So even though I could be telling you this, maybe you could be subconsciously uh, influencing me for my next few paintings to be fairly political. Like maybe it's a comment on the fact that Barbados is currently transitioning into becoming a republic. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that, but oh. Barbados is, yeah, mm -hmm. so we're actually no longer, to, we're potentially no longer going to be having Queen Elizabeth as our head of state. Instead, we're gonna be electing our own head of state. So that in itself could potentially change Barbados quite a bit. And I feel that mm -hmm. that could add a different political context to a lot of future work, not only for myself, but other artists on the island. So there is that going on. And that is, I, the, the, the opportunities visually for that are will be yes are ample ample um, yes <laughs> yeah so, sure I mean endless I, yeah. yeah so I look forward as to how I interpret that into my work along with what I learn on my journey um, I find the more and more reading that I do um, my view on democracy in particular has changed a little bit how but, in yeah. what way in the sense that what could happen? What could happen in a world that is? How can I explain this? Okay, so you know how the the the, the idea of democracy is that everybody in has a right and they have some political voice. And they have a political opinion. So, and that's that being said, everybody therefore has the right to vote. But what happens mm -hmm. if you give that ability to the wrong persons or the people that aren't fully informing themselves of the political climate that's going on in the nation? So for example, um, okay, so how can I put this gently? <laughs> it's basically no, it's putting power, putting putting too much power in the wrong people's hands and they can end up being the majority and voting for who they like as opposed to who is right for the job. So for example, in the United States, they have the issue where they've dealt with Donald Trump for the past almost four years and they've been paying for it ever since. And that's because there was a mass majority of people who, I think that everybody deserves their political opinion and their rights, but sometimes it can go overboard. Like where, where do you draw what, the line? What kind that's of political idea. system do you, do you think works actually? Do you think there is one political system that, should, that can work? Mm -hmm. Mm, frankly, I have not studied enough to answer that question. <laughs> actually, I will, because a whole essay. what I think is actually whatever um, exists right now, everything has been tried out. If it's mm -hmm. communism, socialism, democracy, uh, whatever. So I think that the, that's my opinion then. If that if there should if there is something that works, it should be something new, because mm -hmm. whatever political system that we have had till now, there is always something going on that's not right actually. And then if you look at that, then democracy is actually the best political system in my opinion. Then it is the best social democracy. Yeah. Yeah, social democracy. Anyway. Um. You like music? Yeah, I'm a general. I'm, I love music so much that you would swear that in some way I'm a musician, but I'm not. <laughs> but I almost act like it. I'm a ginormous fan of hip hop and experimental hip hop. 
jazz and sometimes indie rock. Okay. Can you see that in your work that you, I mean, do you use the, 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 the music or elements of your music in your work? Yeah. So for example, so I got in the habit of, I don't do that anymore, or at least not as much as I used to, but I would put on my headphones, play a song, and sometimes just based on my mood in combination with whatever's going on in the song, that would influence my color scheme for that painting or the subject matter of that painting. Um, and more often than not, boy, do I love to paint a saxophone. That is the most re reoccurring musical instrument because I think it's just so fun and whimsical and you don't, as from what I've seen, from the art that I've been exposed to in Barbados, that is not an instrument that I often see. Um, so I have fun with it. I mean, you recently I did, sorry? No, no, go ahead, yes. Go ahead, keep talking, oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah, so my latest painting in terms of a musical piece would be Black Codes, which I think could be yes, pulled Yes, we up have now. that, we have that, yes. Can yeah. we see it? Yes. Maybe the, there's the, the, that's the, one the with Black the Codes. Yes, the, yeah. the trumpetist, yes. Maybe we can put that on so uh, we can, uh, have our audience also enjoying that one? That's a trumpetist, that's black gold, yes. Right, so this was actually a commission, but luckily for me, the, the, the family that commissioned me to do this piece, they knew that I'm somebody that loves to paint about music, so they knew that I was the right person for the job. Uh, they are fans of a particular trumpeter from the US named Winton Marsalis. And the reason why I titled this Black Codes is for two reasons. One, uh, Winter Marsalis has a song and an album named Black Codes. And two, I feel like in a lot of music, especially from the music from people of color, there tends to very more often than not be a message in the song, whether it is subliminal or explicit. So you know how there's Morse code, you're sending messages to the do -do 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 -do. So, in that sense, uh, I feel like there's always going to be messages, codes in your lyrics. Your set, your there's something to be said to the audience, to, whether it's a story, uh, something that's personally happening, or an observation. Because you know, music, music is the is just like visual art in that in that case, where painting is the eyes, music is the ears. There's something to be told. It doesn't matter whether you're seeing it or hearing it, but you can feel it one way or another. Do you have a reason why you didn't um, outline the face of the musician? That was because I wanted the viewer to be able to see themselves within the painting, because if I had made the details of Winton within this piece, then it would just been him. But the truth is that could be anybody uh, playing the trumpet anybody of color, anybody who was an enjoyer of music, and anybody, especially if you're a musician, that sensation of, of creating music, that is a beautiful feeling that is felt universally. Whether you play or not, but especially for those who play. So for example, I have a friend named Jeremy who used to play trumpet as, I think in his like uh, high school years. And when he saw this piece, he instantly messaged me and he told me like how he felt about it. And that was exactly what I wanted to happen. He saw this, and despite there not being any like uh, facial features and such, he he reflected. He emotionally had an experience when he saw this piece, mm -hmm. and that is how I wanted people to feel when they saw that, including you, the people that commissioned the piece. Immediately. Okay, you talk a lot about the color scenes in your work. I mean, that's very very important for you. The colors you use and everything. So, and yeah. I see this one and I saw this uh, uh, swim, don't sink. I mean, both are using a lot of um, blue and green, or blue more or less. Mm -hmm. um, does they relate to each other, the colors, or the way you felt when you does were the... painting them? Um, well, for some, we don't think that color scheme is reflective of my mood at the time. But for black holes, the, the blue background, so, truth be told, that was actually to the preference of the client. They wanted, there was two paintings that they wanted. There was one for Billie Holiday, which was mostly red in the background. 
and then Wynton Marsalis mm -hmm. had the blue background. So they wanted that uh, duality. Oh, okay. uh, that was that, that was why I chose blue. Otherwise, I probably would have done it in gray. And that would have been a very different painting. It would have looked much darker. <laughs> okay, great. I loved really one of your paintings that I really caught my attention was uh, the exhibition. Oh, yeah. I want to show that because I, that caught really my uh, my attention. And I want you to elaborate more about this painting. Yeah, now that is a fan favorite. Um, so the exhibition is supposed to be an illustration of my literal mind. So my thought process on my pieces, which come after which. And at the time that I did this, this was an 18, not was, this is an 18 by 24 inch uh, canvas painting. And I didn't have any more canvases after this, but I had several ideas I still wanted to produce. And then it clicked in my head like, wait, what if I did a few paintings within a painting? And that's normally something that you see like people of a higher skill level do. But I thought, you know what, I'm gonna try it anyway. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And it worked out in the end. Um, so for example, you see the purple man that is first on the wall to the right. So yes. that, yeah, so that is actually based on one of my favorite album covers ever. And one of my favorite albums is called Atrocity Exhibition by a rapper named Danny Brown. And then the gray painting, the black and white one with the red square in the, in the corner, that is called Mad Villainy. It is based on an album cover from another album that I really love from one of my favorite rappers named MF Doom. And then the third piece was more so, I guess you can say how I felt about doing this piece. Cause you can see that in the face is a little bit of anxiety or quite a bit of anxiety, but yet there's these like euphoric colors of like a little bit of blue, some pink, and some yellow and that's how i felt while i was creating this piece because i this piece took me days like normally i do a piece in a day but this took me a full week because i wanted to make sure because there's ample a lot of blending in this piece going on here so mm -hmm. i was doing a lot of blending with the greens and the yellows of the floor making sure that it went well with the wall i think the hardest part about this piece was probably uh, just the walls, the walls and the dimension, that, that's not something that I'm accustomed to because normally I do uh, portraits, like bizarre um, portraits of the face and the body, but not scenes, not literal rooms like this. So this was something that felt really good to do. It felt out of my comfort zone. And I was like, hey, wow, I actually exceeded my own expectations as to how this came out. But um, yeah, anybody that's looking at this piece, I want them to know that this is what my mind looks like like I have so many ideas going on and it's not like I ever run out of them. It's just how am I going to produce them? And in this case, I did several of them all at once in one piece. Okay. And that creature on the uh, foreground, that's the spectator? That is, I call, what did I call him? I had a name for him, but I can't remember. But basically, he's an incomplete idea that I have. That is a future idea for painting in development, literally, because he's not complete. He's a incomplete robot. <laughs> yeah. So you feel like uh, if I listen to you, this uh, the, this creature, it's it's more like a robot looking at what you have on the walls. A more robot that. that it, it, a actually, the, the, the person in the middle of it's not a person, it's something. Mm -hmm. It's like a robot or whatever. In the painting. Well, to put it short, I call him a robot, but he's not a robot. It's kind of complicated. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a long story. But basically, he is an incomplete robot. Let's just leave it at that. OK. Mm. No, quite interesting. Actually, and this is a new development in your work. This is one of your latest works. Mm -hmm. Uh, this painting you mean the exhibition yes oh uh, that was actually produced from since august so i produced that the week before my very first solo exhibit and i thought like you know when you as an artist when you're getting ready for an exhibit there's that one piece that you want to catch the attention of everybody in the room mm -hmm. so that that the so when i produced the exhibition that was it for me like i wanted that to be my 
the, the, the centerpiece. The centerpiece, okay. the, the show off piece. <laughs> but um, along with that, I also did a different painting called Bend We Don't Break, which was my first canvas of that size, 40 by 40 inches. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it could be pulled up. Maybe you could look at it real quick. Bend We Don't yes. Break. Can we put that uh, on? Yes, yeah, great. The reason, the reason why I love this piece so much is because it is, for me, it's a celebration of my journey as an artist up to this point. So anybody that's been a fan of my work for the past 10 months or so, you can see that there's characters in this um, ensemble that have actually existed from previous work. So for example, you can actually almost recognize Mr. Blackie in the middle, like down the middle to the bottom. And yeah. then there's the rat face that came from my artwork called Rat Bossy. It was a painting of a, a nude woman with a rat head on a big red couch. And then you could also see um, just little motifs that, that are, from, are from past works that I've just been all clashed into this one piece. Lots of color, lots going on. There's a lot, it's a very musical, very loud piece. There's a saxophone, there's drums, there's a wine glass, there's a trumpet, there's basically a party going on so like i said a celebration yeah. of me and everything i've done up to this point and the reason why i titled it "Ben, we don't break is because there have been several times especially in the beginning and in the middle of summer that i was wondering like oh like what's the point like what why am i painting what why am i an artist do i even want to do this anymore uh those are moments where i almost felt like i was almost felt like I was running out of ideas or I was just being less confident with my with my style because you know as an artist that like, you're frequently wondering what is my style or what direction is it going to go so that's why there's certain pieces such as like rap boxing and the exhibition uh black holes stylistically and and in terms of skill those were actually times where I wanted to prove to myself that I could go beyond what it was that I was doing because I had got in the habit of doing these colorful backgrounds and a black outlined character in the foreground, just like how I have here in Then We Don't Break. And I wanted to prove to myself that I could do more than that. And in turn, also prove other people that, hey, like this guy, he actually has, he has a little bit of skill. He, he can, okay. he, when he tries, he can, he can do his shading and, you know, add some dimension into his work, not so two dimensional, because I've been trying to get in the habit of being more three dimensional. Hence the highlights of the suit that you see in um, black coats. I think that we have to give some time to the audience. See if yeah. there are some questions coming up for you, Brandon. Maybe cool. there are some <laughs> questions. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. Oh, in terms of mixing politics. Okay. In terms of mixing politics and art, do you think there is maybe more overlap there than you think? As much as contemporary art tackles political sensitive matters from which needed alter alternate perspectives? Yes, because wh even whether I like it or not, I've been told this by several people, like sometimes my work ends up being more political than I think because, and mm -hmm. I think that may be because from the audience perspective, there is a context being set. And I feel like it is very necessary for art to get political, especially, especially in these times, because even if you're not getting a message across verbally or from a newspaper article, sometimes you do need to give people an illustration as to what is going on from your eyes in the case of, of your society, of your environment. And sometimes you can hit people much harder with a visual message than you can with a written message because it gives them an illustration as to the emotions that are invested. Um, and whatever is good, I, I grew up in Barbados. So I, I haven't grown up in a worn torn country and such, but you can see from works that are political and are speaking against the government and such or against war or against uh, white collar crime those works have a tremendous amount of weight and as they should. And I feel that is incredibly important, especially in this day and age. And I feel that artists 
often do have that responsibility to speak out on what is going on, whether whether they do that with their words or with their work. I think so too. I mean, actually, uh, this question, what's been asked, is is very relative to your work because, um, I mean, it's not for nothing that you want to study political science. And I, I yeah. think um, that it's going on in your head. The all your paintings. I mean, what we are showing is only one a couple of months of paintings and mm -hmm. all of them are in my opinion a really political relative relevant so mm -hmm. it's not um, you can't separate those two um seeing at your work looking at your work and analyzing your work yeah so because because it's coming from me and i'm a member of my society so whether I like it or not it is a comment <laughs> especially <Sure. laughs> Mr. Blackie or other pieces that I've done. Yeah. How do you how do how do you come up with the titles for your work? And do you see the titles as holding particular significance to their wider context? That's Catherine Kennedy. Thank you, Ken Catherine. Okay. So how I title my work, uh, I would say about a quarter or half of my work, the titles are actually based on song titles from songs that I love and they just happen to carry the message that I want to carry within my work. If not a song title is something that I that is that is uh what's the, addressing whatever it is that's going on in the piece. Um I forgot the rest of the question <laughs> but yeah. titles have a have yeah you were saying you were saying something how do you Come up with the title of the work. Oh yeah, like title. You know, it's the one thing that's more fun than painting, naming the painting <laughs> for me, especially because it's very fun. Because I feel like the title sets the stage for what it is that you're looking at. I feel like um, I see a lot of professionals, or even my favorite artists, not title their work, and it doesn't bother me per se. But I can't imagine producing the work that I do. And not giving it a title. There's, I've only done that three times ever, and that was only because I had so many ideas for a title that I couldn't nail just one. So I just untitled it. But otherwise, I think a, a title is absolutely necessary. It sets the stage for what it is that the person is looking at, and it gives them a hint as to what you were thinking. Because a lot of times the audience doesn't get a chance to speak to the artist about the work. But actually, it's I mean, just the way you approach your work, because some artists like the audience to see what mm. they want in the work. So, yeah. I mean, that's the, that's a really a different approach of uh, how you want to relate with the audience with your work. Yeah. But I mean, it's a, the, your titles are so specific. I mean, it's just <laughs> what you want people to see yeah. in your work. What, and you want to direct the people to what you want to express with what you're presenting and that's very important because um your work is it it speaks it's it, yeah. it's very i mean if, it, not, if, if the painting hasn't said enough at least the title is saying something that's a literal message whether it's a title like um black clothes no more parties in lime grove or what's another painting i did uh dreaded rasta that's another piece i did recently um yeah i love my titles i love my titles just as much as i love the work <laughs> Do you have a specific gallery that you present your work at? Uh, at this point in time, no. The, my work, my gallery is my Instagram at this point in time. But I do intend to hang a few of my pieces in a particular cafe. But I'm going to keep that as a surprise for now. Okay. That's the so, no, thank you so much. I don't know if you want to show another piece or that you want to say something. Yeah. Oh. About. Um... Uh, okay, so I want to say, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this. This is really awesome. Um, oh, a, uh, a oh answer, there are what? some questions. So yeah, can sure, we I put can those answer. questions up? Yeah, I'm down for answering more questions. Okay, uh, here, there's another question here for you. Thank you, Anneli. Um, uh, that's you a good question. I have met I have met other artists in Barbados plenty, um, 
some of which are actually my favorite, uh, such as Sheena Rose, for example. Um, there's even there's there's so much talent on this island. It's actually unbelievable, and that like blew my mind recently. But um, do I want to be in the community per se? I mean, whether like I know I am in the community, but as for the mixing and mingling, um, it's so it's okay. I don't. I like to keep to myself very often, so I just focus on me and my work. And if there's ever anybody that I like that catches my attention immensely, like I seek them out and just something. I have a lot to learn. So the people that I speak to in the Beijing community in regards to the art the most, that like those are the people that I want to learn from because there's something that they have or something that they know that I'm interested in. So for example, I, I'm actually looking for a creative mentor one of these days, somebody that could take me to the next level of painting, but I don't necessarily want to go to the, to the college either. So, Do you feel like you... Yeah, do you feel like you want to interact with uh, because sometimes um, it's very nice uh, to interact with other artists, but let's give some space to the other questions. Um, mm -hmm. They are, let's see what the questions are. Uh, my greatest inspiration up to this day. I would, mm -hmm. Okay, in terms of an artist, a visual artist, my greatest inspiration would have to be George Kondo because his work is absolutely amazing. I know that sounds very like cliche, but his work is amazing to me. And how I found him is that he's he's actually created a few um, album covers for albums for Kanye West, who's one of my favorite rappers growing up. So that's a significant. So that's kind of like wow, like. An accomplished, amazing artist like him, like his work has has directly influenced um, a body of music that I appreciate. So I hope that one of these days my paintings becomes an album cover for a, a rapper that I love. So wonderful. Uh, that's some inspiration from artists, from music that inspires me or influences me. Definitely MF Doom, Earl Sweatshirt, and Kanye West. By by far, like my influences tend to be or inspirations tend to be based on musicians and um lately i've been going through a phase where i'm trying to do more work that feels black hence why i did a painting like dreaded rasta because i i feel like that's a because uh, growing up in barbados i was often considered to be red because i'm mixed race and i don't think that that to me that doesn't make any sense because bottom line i'm black 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 and i'm in my work i'm also expressing my anger from that in my childhood because that's that's what we are. That's who we are. Okay. Can yeah. we give an, uh, another question before we wrap it up? Uh, that's a good question. I am very soon going to be doing some work off the canvas, and I'm looking forward to trying out some sculpting, particularly in stone. I don't want to do wood. I prefer stone because I think that would be more... I don't want to say too much, but from here on out, I'm actually looking into doing some costume design and sculpting with stone and potentially fashion such as okay. like t-shirts and such now so we can look forward to a lot more of brandon kirk best isn't it sure yeah, that sounds come. great it's all this is only my first year so i look forward to it. i think my one year anniversary is in the first week in november so Wonderful. I have to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Brandon. I mean, it's just been thank quite you, you. very, very nice to talk to you and uh, to know more about you. And I'm looking forward to your development because I, I think there is a lot of Brandon Kirk best to be seen and to be acquainted to. Thanks. I hope you come to Paris um, one day. <laughs> yeah, sure. Maybe you can uh, have a show at my gallery. That sounds yes, would, really great. I would love that. Beautiful. Yeah, okay. So we work on that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's then wrap it up. Uh, the closing of this saloon. Again, I would love to thank uh, the Catapult Partners. That's the American uh, Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk for making this series of saloon happen. And that Curacao can also be involved in this series because... Um, I mean, I feel very honored to be part of this whole 
uh, program. Uh, and please remember to join us the next catapult lockdown that will be on Tuesday, uh, October the 20th, and uh, at one o'clock. Uh, then we will feature Johanna Agiak Selenis from Martinique, and she'll be talking to uh, in dialogue with Richard Victor Senseli Cayo, also from Guadeloupe, and in the afternoon at four with Joni P. Gordon from Jamaica. And uh, please don't remember, don't forget to subscribe to the Fresh Milk YouTube channel and watch all the previous uh, uh, LVS sessions, but also the coming up. Thank you so much and uh, hope to meet you somewhere someday. And bye-bye. Sure, bye. Bye.